Welcome to Boundless Pursuit, a weekly podcast providing motivation, entertainment, and education to anglers and outdoorsmen. I hope that the stories you'll find here will encourage you to chase your passion more fervently, to open your mind to new opportunities and perspectives. Your engagement and feedback is critical to the growth of this show, and I would love to hear your suggestions on topics or potential guests. You can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com or at my website, www.boundless-pursuit.com. That's where you'll find all related articles, media, and merchandise. Please remember, the show will gain traction from your support. Be sure to like, comment, and share this podcast to your friends and connections. I'm your host, David Graham. Now let's get on to today's episode. A big part of the Boundless Pursuit podcast is hearing the stories of anglers pursuing their dreams, dream destinations, and dream species. And I get so motivated by the guys that we've had on here, many who have done some incredible things, and many that have a very real ambition to do big things in the future. Today's guest, though, has got a life experience that is hard to imagine. Larry Walker is in his late 70s, but this dude has got a level of grind to him that is astonishing. And don't let his old age fool you. Larry pushes a pace that most people a third of his age couldn't keep up with. He's fished in over 50 countries and virtually every rainforest on the planet. Global expeditions from the oceans to the jungles to the mountains and every place you can possibly imagine. And his exploits as an angler are leaps and bounds beyond anything anybody else has done that I've had on here so far. And while the fish that he has caught will absolutely blow your mind, it's the story of how he got there that's really so amazing. And the guy's path to the financial freedom that it takes to even make these kind of expeditions a reality is just completely insane. And it's one that started in a tiny local tackle shack that literally had dirt floors selling minnows and the walker family business is like a peanut that turned into an empire where the wholesome sale of shiners on those dirt floors evolved into massive operations of marinas and lodges and larry is just that stereotypical texan a stubborn bull who won't take no for an answer which is probably why he's managed to push his business to be as big as it is his story is just so incredible it's the embodiment of the american dream building generational wealth and future from the humblest beginnings that you can imagine. The kind of story that should really be captured in a book, and it is. I recently read Larry's book, Minnows to Marlin, and it's a title that creatively captures the journey of the Walker family's minnow selling business, all the way to Larry's conquest of Marlin and much, much more. Every single chapter details a journey as an angler who is relentless in the pursuit of the next bite, the next target species. I'm glad I was able to catch the guy between trips. He seems like he's always on the move to the next country, the next adventure. And I am honored to have had Larry come onto this program to tell his story firsthand. But I do encourage any adventure-loving angler to pick up a copy of this book. I personally read it on my recent flights to Idaho when I was chasing the white sturgeon just to get the adventure juices flowing. You can find this book on Amazon. You've got to pick it up. It's an amazing, amazing book and an incredible story that I don't think anybody can compare to. Guys, you are going to love this story. Remarkable life journey, incredible growth as an angler, and just an awesome, awesome dude. This is Larry Walker. Did you hear that? I did. All right. So Larry Walker, I got to take you and I can get you. Um, But I really appreciate you coming on here. I I felt like I I only had narrow windows, it seems, with you between trips because you're like in Argentina one day. The next time I get on Facebook, you're in, you know, I don't know where, Texas, you're back home. I don't either. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like, geez, I don't know when I'm going to work this guy in, but but okay. man, I, I appreciate you coming on. I guess uh, I don't know where to start. Well, so how about how about this most recent trip? I mean, I, I was just on your page and saw these giant bass you were catching. Well, I got so lucky. I got a phone call from a good friend of mine named Josh Jones, who is absolutely a phenom. He's guiding on a lake called OHIV in West Texas, and um, they're doing live scoping. It is absolutely revolutionary and what they are doing is makes old school 
throw it out the window, old school out the window. It's uh, it's unbelievable. And I'm I'm so lucky that I get to fish with some of these guys because he's he's just an absolute genius. It's it's so different. It's really different. Yeah, that stuff's fascinating. At, at, that's one of those funny topics where it's like every time new technology comes out, there's like you know, there's the people that say, oh, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be doing this. But it's like, it's almost like you're you're denying the inevitable to take that position because, you. I mean, a few years back, people were saying the same thing about a generic, you know, side imaging scanning was the same way. And then before that, you know, any type of sonar, but it's just, I mean, it, time marches on and this this new technology blows my mind. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I haven't I haven't been fortunate enough to use it, but that is some amazing stuff. And now you're seeing all these crazy 16, 17 pound bass records are falling left and right. Especially at yeah. OH Ivy. That's like that's like ground zero for all this stuff right it's now. It's ground zero and and I, I have a good analogy for it if you want me to give it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that I have all because you have thirty five hundred or four thousand dollars to buy a live scope or a forward facing sonar. That's nothing. That's the that's just part of the game. If you do not know how to utilize it, it's just another depth finder. It, but these guys, especially the young guys, I'm going to admit, they've got it down. It is a science what they're doing. And David, it's amazing what we did yesterday. It's amazing. We caught fish, black bass. The water temperature was 58.7. We caught fish on the nest spawning in 15 to 17 foot of water. Oh, geez. You can't see 15 or 17 foot of water. Right. But with this new technology and the way they, they have, they have absolutely uh, got it down to a T is they were seeing fish that are not moving. You see two fish in 17, because there's a lot of brush. The Texas lakes, we got a lot of brush. And they're seeing these fish, and they know that they're spawning. And it's exactly like fishing in shallow water when they're spawning, but we're watching it on television. I call yeah. that great <laughs> television. It's amazing technology. And like I say, these guys that know how to use it, I, I have one, of course, on my boat. I know how to use it, but I'm not in the same atmosphere as these guys. I mean, these, these Josh Jones and a guy named Kyle Hall, among others, have perfected it. And I'm so blessed that I get to go with these guys. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I've had a, uh, we sold our family business, uh, our marina, and the marina uh, in between Dallas and Fort Worth called Lynn Creek Marina. We had it for 31 years. And before okay. that, we were in the sporting good business and boat and motor business and anything to do with water. I've had something to do with, I mean, I've sold bait. We've made rods. I've been an outfitter. I've been commercial fishing, uh, rented boats, sold boats, anything to do with water. I've pretty much had my hand in it one time or the other. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I'm not, I won't, I'll be the first to admit, like, I am a total novice and a complete idiot when it comes to a lot of those electronics, even the most basic electronics. And I don't do a great deal of bass fishing. I'm like a shallow water angler. It's like, once I get into deep water, I have no clue what I'm doing. But uh, I'll get on the boat with my buddies who do, and, and they'll be like, you see that little mark right there next to that fuzzy red stuff? Yeah, like, that's a, you know, that's a fish sitting on such and such. I'm like, I don't know what you're looking at. I'm looking at hieroglyphics here. How do you know that's a fish? But uh, it's a totally different skill set. And it's just funny the different kind of skills different anglers have. But reading sonar and reading maps and reading things like that, that's a that's a skill I don't possess, but it's definitely one that I admire. But, um, you know, when you see the si this um, uh, live image stuff, it's like it's you have to be impressed with what the market has driven technology wise. And then, you know, you can, you can get the people that sit back and get angry about it. But at some point you got to ask yourself, like how archaic do I really want to sit here and be? Well, that's true. Now, you know, everybody's yeah. got a different deal. And especially when it comes to the forward facing sonar, like I say, I've been in this game a long time. It's come a long ways from the little green box that Lawrence put out back in the sixties or whatever yeah. that was. <laughs> 
everything's gone, everything's got better. But for some reason, this has really got to hire a lot of people. Uh, Josh Jones, in for 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 in particular, he's very sensitive. He got a lot of haters. There's a lots of haters that don't like it, um, and the, some of them don't have it. But they there's some reason that they're really against it. And and I say you better get on the on the plane, or you're gonna you're gonna be left at the airport. But we not only use it in black bass, I've used it on musky fishing. I had the honor of fishing last year with another phenom named Nolan Spangler in uh, Minnesota. Okay. We went to Lisa Lake. I have never caught a muskie, never saw a muskie. All I've ever heard is the old term, the fish of a thousand cats. Yeah. So I went up with him. I jumped in the boat. We caught, I caught 22 muskies in two days. Oh my gosh. That's a home run. I had one that was 52 and a half inches long. Um, I had never seen one. Yeah. It's all about forward facing electronics. And, um, I just had a great time. And of course these guys, they're so he, there's another secret guy. He doesn't want to take any pictures of his electronics when we're fishing. And I don't blame him, you know, and then we go, now I'm going, I'm leaving Sunday to go back to Idaho where I went last, I went twice last year. I caught an 8.53 ounce smallmouth bass plus some other seven pounders, which is people fish all their life and never catch a six pound smallmouth bass. Oh yeah. And, and, um, and the guy I'm fishing with, he's another phenom. He's, he's another live scoper. And then I was down in your part of the world. I went out fishing for Goliath Grouper, with okay. guy, Eric Line, and he used the live scope there. I mean, we watched them. You watch them take your bait. Yeah. It's it's uh, like I say, we can go on and on about live scope, but it uh, it's I'm really for it. And of course, the the blowback on it, like we're saying, is Nolan is banned from fishing musky tournaments in, in uh, Minnesota. They will not let live scope in the tournament. Mm. And I go back to a, a, an old saying that I just heard from Jimmy Houston. I'm very, I'm kind of bragging because he, he and I are very good friends. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really, I really like him. He, if you knew him, he, he's a first class guy and he laughs all the time on camera yeah. or off camera. He well, laughs. I- I'm like a lot of people where I grew up watching his shows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you can't be in fishing and have not grown up watching some of those he's guys. Been on, he's been on TV. This is his 44th year oh, I've yeah. been on TV. So, and we we were talking about something else. We were talking about the A rig. You know what the A rig is? The Alabama rig. Oh yeah, and I remember the, they banned that thing too. With and all the that, little. That's what we were talking about because he he's really into the guys that bass and all the big shots and. And he went up to the tournament director and after they banned it for a tournament, he said, why did you, why did you ban it for? Why? He said, the catch is too many fish. Too many fish. Yeah. <laughs> and Jimmy said, isn't that what we're trying to do? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, he's, uh, yeah, he's on board. You know, he's trying to stay with the time that you get left behind. Yeah. You know, everybody, you know, the difference is, is on the live scope and not having a live scope. Just think about putting your hand over your eyes and fishing or yeah. opening your eyes up and seeing what you're throwing. It, it's really a, a really big deal. Like I say, I still like the other type of, I'll, I'll fish in a muddy hole. It, it doesn't make any difference. I'm going to go fishing. But if I, if I have a way to catch fish in a different technique, I'm all sure. for it. Well, that's the funny thing about it. No one's making anybody use it. Like, there's no sense in getting upset. Right. At what, right. and it, there's no sense getting upset at what somebody else is doing. Okay, well, are you doing it? So, no, you, you never want to sit back and watch somebody else and, like, I don't know, get mad at their success or yes. what, what they're deriving happiness from. But it's funny you mentioned Idaho. Uh, ironically, I'll be in Idaho next week myself, but... But um, I'm going out there for the for the sturgeon. I'm not doing the smallmouth thing, although I'd like well, to. I did, the, I did the sturgeon in Idaho, and I didn't do well. I went on the Salmon River, mm -hmm. and I fished a, a half a day. I got kind of a bad charter, but I went up to Oregon. Yeah, and man, we knocked them out. 
yeah. David, we knocked them out. I caught a 10 and a half footer and it was really, the fishing was easy. It wasn't really a hard trip like I thought it was mm -hmm. going to be. And of course, the, the charter co uh, captain we had really, knew, we didn't use live scope, but I caught my big one, the 10 and a half foot sturgeon. I caught it on a seven pound salmon. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we, I didn't know they, you know, they, they're not really a meat eater per se. And they're a bottom feeder, but uh, I don't know. We caught, I bet you we caught 25 in, in three yeah. days. Yeah, I've got a buddy out there that catches them out of kayaks. Um, and he's oh, wow. really, he's really, in fact, I have to, on the sidebar conversation, send you some of his video. He he had a vi uh, video go viral a couple of years ago where he was filming a guy that was fighting one in front of him. And it this, I mean, it's eight foot long and it jumps beside his kayak. Like, I mean, that, that thing can kill you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he catches them from kayak. His name's Steve Carroll. And, um, you know, they don't grow them as big in Idaho, but I just thought like that angle, like he'll catch them from the bank. He'll catch them from a kayak. I'm like, that's. It's that's so beautiful up there. It's worth yeah. the trip just being on the river. I caught, I caught a lot of smallmouth bass waiting for a bass, maybe mm -hmm. waiting for a sturgeon by when I was on the yeah. salmon river. It's just gorgeous. Though. They're a beautiful part of the world. It just seems so weird because, you know, they'll go out there and catch a rainbow trout, a, a rainbow trout that would be photo worthy by any, you know, person's normal standards mm -hmm. <laughs> and then chop its head off and stick a hook through it and cast it back out there. It's kind of a it's kind of a funny, uh, a, a, fun, a funny thing there. But um, we're well, well, talking about rainbow trout. I've never been a trout. Trout's never been high on my mm -hmm. my agenda, to be honest with you. I've never cared too much about them. But I got I went to Jurassic Lake in Argentina. Yeah, I saw that. That's on my little list of things oh, to ask about. <laughs> David, David, man, this is not a fishing trip. This is a catching trip. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say 99% of the fish, I've, I've been twice, and I've signed up again to go and this September, the 99 of them are bigger than any trout that most people ever catch in their whole life. Yeah. My, the fish I caught, David, weighed average 10 pounds a piece rainbow trout. Unreal. The last trip I caught, I caught a 23 pound, four ounce rainbow trout. The trip before that, I caught one that weighed 20.89. Jeez. Those are big trout. Those are really big. Well, trout. it was the it was the king salmon I saw you catching out there that what really caught my eyes. Well, oh, I had never my been, goodness! I've been up to Alaska one time, and I'll be honest, I didn't have a very good trip. But I went on this king salmon trip uh, with a couple of guys that have been like twenty times to Alaska. I caught a fifty-three pound, seven ounce king salmon, which is gigantic. Yeah. And they catch them bigger. I'm going bigger, back yeah. next year at a different time. You know, those fish are migrating and they only, they're only in the river for a certain amount of time. And, uh, we're trying to get the right timing. So it was a beautiful tree, you know, fishing, fishing in a glacier lake and a glacier river with icebergs. And then you, when was the last time you cup your hand in a stream and drank the water? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that down here in South Florida. No, no, but Start growing well, we an extra did. leg out of my head or something. Right. <laughs> and uh <laughs> but we were drinking water out of the out of the stream and it was the you know, everything was just so beautiful and no no human intervention there. Mm. And uh, um, a small thing is the guides there, the tag end of the lines. You know, when you tie a knot, you got three or four inches extra and you cut it off. I thought this was very admirable. They they cut that line off, the two to three inches, and put the line in their pocket instead of throwing it down. You know, that yeah, seems so yeah. insignificant. But it meant a lot to me that those people really cared about the environment that much. So right. it was well, good to not do. You, you know, like little things like that, I think, give the impression of the kind of hands you're in too, because if your guide is that invested in taking care of the resource, then you know, yes. he's going to be a thousand times more invested in making sure that you enjoy your experience. So little, little things like that, I pick up on too. Yeah, What, what actually makes it really for me so different is I know I don't look it, 
but I'm 77 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been doing this a long time. When I was growing up, we did not know the difference in conservation. We weren't trying to do anything wrong, but we, you know, in Texas in the seventies, the bath limit was 15 per person per day. Yeah. And we, I got a picture that was in the Dallas morning news that I had 45 fish on a stringer on my <laughs> back. Back in the day, there was three of us fishing. I had 45 black bass. And now you're lucky to catch five. The limit's five, and you're lucky to get five someday. Right, yeah. There's a lot of pressure and a lot of different things that have changed the dynamics of it. But. Well, I think I only started following your stuff ah, maybe within the last – two years i stumbled across your page and obviously it's like you know you've got so many showstopper photos and fish yeah. i'm like oh my gosh you know and then i just went down the whole rabbit hole of scrolling <laughs> and looking at everywhere you've been and everything you've done but i'm curious like like was it always was the traveling side of it always i mean were you always that way with like the intrepidation or did these real international trips, is that more of a recent thing or has this been no, like a lifelong actually, deal? Actually, it all, you know, we, I live in Texas and so we would, uh, we would travel down to Mexico and do the bath lakes in Mexico. And I'd go to Acapulco drinking and fishing back yeah. in the sixties <laughs> and seventies. And, uh, of course in my book, I describe every mm -hmm. bit of it for men of the Marlin, but what happened, you know, I had a tackle store. We had a tackle store that we had for 46 years. And I stood behind the counter and talked about fishing and hunting all day long. And one day a tackle salesman came in that sold Bill Norman crankbait out of the back of his car. I don't know yeah. where he got them, but we, yeah. <laughs> but we bought them. They were a little cheaper buying them from him. And he asked me, he said, Larry, he knew I was crazy about fishing. He said, you want to go to Honduras black bass fishing? And the first thing I said was, where's Honduras? I don't even know. Where yeah, Honduras. yeah. I knew it was in Central <laughs> America, and I, I never knew they had a black bass population. Mm -hmm. So that really, really lit the lit the fuse there. I got I got 24 of my friends together, and we're all redneck Texans. They all bass yeah. fish. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember the Garcia 5,000 reels, the the – the old bait casting reel that that's nearly everybody started out with. Now this is part we of like Abu a, Garcia. Yeah. Abu Garcia oh. 5,000. And then they upgraded to the 5,500 that had ball bearings in it. Yeah. But we used to use pistol grip rods and uh, I didn't, but a lot of people did. I, I had always been a two piece. I mean, a two handed rod guy. So we got 24 of us and we went to, Honduras, the Lake Yehoah. This really changed my life. I had one deal that, if you ever had anything change your life, this was one thing that really changed my life. Yeah. We went down there and I had 24 guys and we, it was a four day fishing trip. In two and a half days, the biggest fish weighed was four pounds. So we say we've been scammed. Yeah. Let's go down and see what the girls look like and have a few. <laughs> this was 1976. Yeah. So we go down there and, and the girls liked it. They, they fell in love with us American boys. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a few more cocktails than we should have. And we stumbled back to camp the next day, just to really just to kill the rest of the time. Cause we thought we got, got a wild goose chase and, me and a friend of mine named Jim Bob. Jim Bob. You know, fish. anybody named Jim Bob is going to be a great friend. Yeah, we've, been <laughs> fishing, we, we've been fishing together for 50 years now, but yeah. he is a, he's a real, I'm a kind of a drugstore redneck. He's a card carrying redneck. Yeah. <laughs> and we were sitting in the boat together in an aluminum boat with a guy. It was kind of, iconic because the the fog was lifting off of the water and we were sitting in it where where two creeks came into lake yohoa which is a mm. gorgeous beautiful lake and there was another friend of mine that was in a boat about 50 yards away and it was dead calm david and i said out loud 
I wish I could get a bite, get my line broken, something happen. And like I say, Kodak moment, I get, I get a little tap tap on my rod. I reel down to set the hook and I set the hook and the rod broke in two. Oh, geez. I was using a Shakespeare seven foot popping rod that we use for trout and redfish. Mm -hmm. And my line, my rod broke. I'm shocked. And the guy in the other boat threw over where I was casting and caught an 11 pound, six ounce bass, which I had in 1976 in Texas, there were no big fish. If you caught an eight pound fish in Texas in the 70s, you got your picture in the newspaper. Yeah, you're a legend. <laughs> it was, it was, it, then when uh, these fish were imported from Florida in 1954, but yep. then I, uh, then Jim Bob threw out and it sounded like a 22 going off his line pop. Oh gosh. It went down like this and the line popped. Yeah. <laughs> now, we didn't use drags back then. We used to get a pair of pliers and tighten the drag down Yeah. <laughs> because our old saying is we can play with them once they're in the boat. So right. that was the deal. <laughs> So I got a rod. I got another rod. I didn't even have a line on the other rod. I didn't think I was going to catch anything. So I'm like this. I'm trying to get the line. I'm nervous. I can't get yeah, the yeah. line. <laughs> I get it out and I make a cast and I call it a 10 and a half pound bass. Oh my so goodness. we sat there in about 40, my, 45 minute time. And I caught, we caught a stringer bass, seven bass that weighed 72 pounds and four ounces. We killed them. Holy this, cow. I'm telling you, this is a different era, mm -hmm. and uh, things were so different. We put these fish in a 72 quart ice chest, the igloo mm -hmm. ice chest. We put them on the air, airline and took them home. Wow. <laughs> and and uh, ironically, we were having the Dallas boat show, and we were in the Dallas boat show. We sold, I sold skeeter boats, bass tracker boats, I sold a lot of fishing boats, and I brought them to the boat show. And people in Texas had never, ever seen bass that big. You know, people used to go to Florida and, and put a shiner on and, and catch a, a big fish in Florida back in mm -hmm. those days. But Texas didn't have any big fish. I mean, like I say, eight pounds was, was big. Yeah. So people, I was a star of the show. I'm asking, I'm answering questions and people are real curious about it and a little light bulb went off in Larry's head. I said, I want to take people fishing to Honduras. Yeah. <laughs> so I started Walker's Bass Tours. Yeah. And, uh, and it was a little harder than I thought. It was a third world country. And I think it's a fourth world country now, but I still <laughs> love Honduras. It was very dear to me. Mm -hmm. So we started taking people to Honduras bass fishing, and that opened the door for international travel. I was the first guy to ever go to Cuba when they opened Cuba up in 1977. Jimmy Carter opened it up for tourism and another outfitter from Texas named Dan Snow and I put together trips to Cuba. And then from Cuba, I found out about Peacock Bass in Venezuela. Yeah. I fell in love with Peacock Bass. I fall, I fall in love <laughs> easy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very easy to fall in love with. So I just, you know, Peacock Bass, that was the new deal, man, when I found mm -hmm. Peacock Bass. But I still, I never lost my love for Black Bass. I mean, Black Bass yeah. is number one. And then from Venezuela, I ended up in Brazil. And then from Brazil, Colombia. And then from there, all over the world. I mean, that's where it all started. I'm, I've been into over 50 countries fishing just fishing and i've been very i've been lucky i get to go to some neat places david and i get to go with some neat guys and uh it, i've been very blessed i'll be honest with you, i've been blessed yeah that answered that next question on my my list i'm like well how many countries this you know i i see the photos now and i i know you get around but you mentioned something i that i always find or at least i always enjoy when i hearing uh, when i hear you know it seems like some folks will set like this high bar, you know, I don't know, maybe if you jump up too quickly to catching these incredible fish that, uh, that maybe they find it hard to still enjoy the ones that are in the backyard, like, like a, a bass. Well, uh, I gotta be honest with you. I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't, I don't care about little fish. I really don't. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm just going to be up front with you. It's not that I'm a lead or a or anything. I've no, just no. Got, 
It's not that I got my goal set. I just, in my head, I want to catch the biggest fish that swims in the lake. And I don't want, I usually go to lakes that have big fish in them. Mm-hmm. Like say, we can go down, there's some lakes in Mexico you can go. You can catch 300 fish a day. I won't go. I don't care anything about it. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. A five pounder, the big, it just doesn't end. I'm talking about Larry Walker. I mean, for most people, they would, you know, they well, still they want to go. You're, you I'm are, talking about, I deal all about big. The word I, big is what got me. You are, uh, you're speaking my language because I'm, and I don't have, you know, nowhere near the kind of fish that you've caught. But I mean, I, I admire what you do because that's what I aspire too. I'm, I've, I've always been the same ways. And even if I'm fishing for a, I don't know, a small species, I only want to catch the big one of yeah, those. That's what I want to do. That's what um, I want to do. And I can be perfectly content with speaking, you know, spinning, you know, like we mentioned before we started recording, like an alligator gar, me and my brother, we would go out and grind for five days, sleeping on the river, being severely dehydrated, going through storms and absolute hell. But if I got one big one, that's all I want. That's all I care about. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I trust me. I, I'm I'm right there with you. I I mean I respect the folks. Uh, you know I got a lot of friends that are like they're species hunters. They like they yeah. they want to have like as many species to their name as possible. And a lot of that is like you know micro fishing. And I don't, I don't know for yeah. me that's it's just it doesn't speak to me. But uh, but I'm I'm the same way with the big fish thing. I think my, you know, journey is maybe only just now beginning. I've never been out of the country ever, but I'm actually scheduled for my first international trip in September. But I look at your page as like fuel or like motivation or like, and and I can't wait to get the book. And I want to talk about the book soon yeah. because, you know, I, I admire that type of, I don't know, the adventurous spirit, um, but I guess I'd be curious, like when when you've made these rounds, is there any particular location or species that is most near and dear to your heart? David, <laughs> everybody asks me that question. I know it's and a hard I one. I, I can't answer it because <laughs> yeah. I, I'm telling you, I fall every time I go to a new location and catch a new species. That's my new favorite thing. That's, yeah, I yeah. love that thing. <laughs> right. So I'm I'm so. Uh, you know, I, I'll be honest. It's not. It's it's the fish, but it's not the fish. I get to mm-hmm. go to rainforests and see animals and birds and plants, and and I'm a I'm a nature lover. I mean, I really love nature. I mean, I I love birds and butterflies and the and the whole gambit and the people. Yeah, I have made so many people friends around the world that I would have never had the chance to meet if it wasn't for fishing. Man. And uh, fishing has been very, I'm, I'm addicted to it. And it's, it's been very, it's the biggest part of my life. Other than my family, fishing is very, very big in my life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The adventurous side of it, I, I, I'm the same way. I, I know every time I go fishing, I'm very much like, you know, I guess it's debatable if, if I'm the distracted one, but I'm, I'm the type of guy, like I'm, I'm looking around, like, I don't want to miss things, but uh, Me I'll either. say you, you, you have got. Stuff. Now, I know this is sort of random, but like, you've probably got one of the most like badass photos that I've seen, and it's 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 not even a fish photo. It's a, uh, and I think I'm assuming it's you in the picture. But there's this photo you have where you're sitting. It looks like in a wooden dugout canoe, slumped over, looking down in a raincoat, in this torrential, <laughs> like 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 biblical proportion downpour. And I'm just like, that is a grind. Like, that is a war. Like, I don't know what you caught on the other end of that trip, but I mean, I... Let me tell you about that photo. Wow. (laughs) That's that's, that's an iconic photo. You're right. A a friend of mine sent me that uh, that picture. I didn't know who that was. That's me in the boat. He took the picture. I didn't know it. We were in what we call in Texas. This was in Columbia. We were in a frog strangler. I mean, it was <laughs> pouring down, and and I I happened to have a high dollar Sims raincoat on mm-hmm. that the zipper was broken. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and and I I was you ever been miserable cold rainforest deal? And David, we caught so many fish; it was incredible. Mm-hmm. We went to a lagoon that we had to walk three and a half miles. To uh, this lagoon through a real, I'm talking about a real jungle. This is no trail in the 
and the Indians or the natives were mm-hmm. carrying the outboard motors on their shoulders. The Unbelievable. Our motor was pretty heavy. And we went to another sidebar was we spent the night in an old cocaine factory in, in, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in Columbia. It was, of course it was deserted, <laughs> but that's yeah. where we, we, we spent the night in, uh, God, it was just a beautiful trip. I, it's talking about species. We caught a lot of different species on that trip. It was talk about uh, five star lodging and accommodations. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it, that the food was good on that one. I had been on some really rugged, rugged trips, rugged trips. So. And I kind I like being off the beaten path. I, I, yeah, I, I'm not mad at at the good lodge too, where they drank. Uh, uh, margaritas at the at the end of the day but you know i i like the i like off the beaten path it's yeah. always david it's always the next valley over i want to go to the next river system over there where nobody's been and i'm trying to that's what i try to do i like i'm very driven you know there's a few places i guess specific to like the amazon or, or south america where it's like for me the allure is the fact that it's off the beaten path. So I know in, in my time where I've like researched, like maybe some, some outfitters or some lodges or some, you know, different tour groups. And, uh, I'll tell you, nothing turns me off more than when I see the photos of literally, it looks like, you know, a white tablecloth affair, wine glasses, and these like amazing cuisine. I'm like that. What? I mean, I guess it's nice, but I'm like, I don't know. Like I, that's I. I feel like you you go out there for a certain experience, and like that is so unfitting of the territory. So it's I don't know, man. That that one's not for me. I I guess I could probably still do it, but I would feel a little weird. Uh. Yeah, it's it's that way. You know, every every place is so different. It's all kind of different. And of course, I I always tell everybody it's all about the fish. It's not all about the fish, but it is mm-hmm. all about the fish. Too. It's kind of a, a, a oxymoron. But the main thing I like to say, I'm so when we get to every every lodge I've ever been to, I'm the first guy on in the water. I'm the first guy mm-hmm. to make a cast. I'm so nervous. Here I am, seventy seven years old. And I get so excited on every day. I'm going fishing tomorrow. I'm really, really excited about it. And it's yeah. a private lake up by Paris, Texas. But, you know, I'm I'm excited about it. I mean, it's just, and that's what drives me. If you don't have that drive. Right. And like I say, I'm telling you, when the guys I grew up with, and when they say, I'm not mad at them anymore, when they talk about fishing, I'm not mad at them. I say goodbye. Because you're, if, if you're not mad at them, it's over with. Yeah, you yeah. Be mad at them. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep going. Yeah, you got to have that fire. And I tell you, I have that fire. I've got. I, you might have saw my most recent bucket list. I want to catch a Nile. I mean, a Goliath tiger fish. Yeah, yeah. And I saw I that post. Catch, yeah, yeah. And I want to see a, a catch a a, a neo, um, uh, Neapolitan Napoleon wrath. wrath or a Napoleon wrath. He said Neapolitan and, Napoleon and, wrath. Uh, and let me, what was the other one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember those oh, yeah, two. I, I want to catch a golden monsoor. I, yes, it, that's right. And I, I'll be honest, I've never been crazy about those because they don't get very big. But yeah. I'm, I want to do that because I want to go see India too, and I want to go to Nepal. I want to go see Kathmandu. I want to go to mm-hmm. the. I want to go to the uh, base camp for Mount Everest. I don't want to climb Mount Everest. I did climb Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> but I I want to go to Kathmandu. I like that name. Don't you like the name? Yeah, Kathmandu? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can well, pronounce I, that. One too, I uh, <laughs> I agree. The Golden Masiers seem like they're held on such a high. Like I mean, they're really a revered fish. It seems like, in, especially in like the traveling freshwater giant fish mm-hmm. um, rings. And I always kind of thought the same thing. As it almost looks like a big fancy looking skinny barbel of some sort, but uh the goonch catfish that live over there in the same rivers are more interesting to me. But um well I like to catch one of those as well. Yeah. I've never been big on catfish for some reason. And yeah, I'm kind of the same way. Yeah. Them, but I don't and I don't fish for sharks, but I just went white shark fishing up in Yeah. Oh I wanted to South talk about Carolina, that one too. Which was, which was amazing. Golly South Carolina. Amazing. What I would not have thought South Carolina. That's interesting. 
But yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken, I guess the guy you went with, correct me if I'm wrong or, or enlighten me, he's he is the only one that is authorized to specifically target them, right? Is there like a science element tied into that where... Absolutely. That's the, that's the whole deal. He Here's the deal. He is so efficient at catching great white sharks, mm. and the sciences are not. So they're <laughs> yeah. using him as a vehicle to get uh get information on great white sharks he's a fascinating guy he's unbelievable he's a he's a shark whisperer mm. and and everything's secret and i can't tell you all the secrets but it's the big <laughs> secret he did, i can't tell you where we went what we used for this and yeah. that we did take some videos but they were very limited right and um uh, it, it, it's a i tell you that fish david you know, you've seen them on TV all your life and movie. I got to touch one and see it and oh, a big black eye. To look him he in the eyes. Monster. He was about nine and a half foot long. They said three and a half or four hundred pounds. He gave a pretty good fight, but not spectacular. They don't jump. But just to see one, it, I've been all over the world. I have never seen them. I've been to Australia yep. and all these countries that have them. I had never seen them. Well, believe it or not, through. you're actually – the third person I've had on this podcast that's caught great whites, um, I had a guy on here. His name's Spencer Wonder. Now, if you want to see somebody that's caught some fish that just defy all logic, like what what he catches don't even make sense. Um, he's mm. caught multiple, and he catches them from the short from land. Yeah, um, but he's caught them up to sixteen feet long from yeah. from short. Granted, it's it's accidental, but you know he he does so much land based shark fishing. Um, but now that guy caught a, uh, what was it? A Greenland shark or a Pacific sleeper wow. shark yeah. Yeah. that was about 16 feet long mm -hmm. from shore. That's his whole thing is he catches everything from land. And it's like, yeah, that one doesn't even make amazing. sense. That's a deep sea fish. Like that, those things live in like thousand feet of water, eating whale carcasses. And, um, it is, but yeah, that you talk about, I mean, on a global scale of like the king of all Kings, like the, the, the ultimate predator, in all of the water. I mean, unless you want to talk about whales, but we're talking fish here. I mean, I guess the great white sharks, like the pinnacle, but I just, I can't imagine the experience of being able to be, because we all watch shark week. We all have seen yeah. jaws <laughs> and like, there's such a, there's no more fish, more engaging to the conscience or stimulating to the mind than the great white shark. So I just can't imagine that touching, movie, touching way, one. Jaws, that movie jaws has kept a lot of people out of the water. Yeah, it yeah. really has. It really, honestly. But you know what? What the this guy's name is Chip. That's uh, the the guide on the great white shark. He told me he said these fish are smart. They're not like a regular mm -hmm. shark. He said they really smart. He said sometimes you hook them, they run towards the boat, and try to bite the line. Oh, that's interesting. And it's very, it was very interesting. And you know, a lot of, you know, you throw a lot of blood out and all that stuff. And that's not what he does. He does another technique, but he, he said the fish are very, very small. I, he did. He sent me a text when I got back. I also caught a tiger shark that day. Wasn't a giant one, about eight or nine foot. And then I caught a, a sandbar shark that was about 150 pounds. Those he are said, some scrappers there. Yeah. Them, them sandbars yeah. are some scrappers. Yeah. They fight. He, they actually fought harder than the great mm -hmm. white, but. He said, he said, I guarantee you, you're the only human that's ever caught a great white, a tiger shark, and a gray shark in, in the same day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting. I, I add that to my resume. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair bet. You know, I'm I'm actually a native to South Carolina, so that, like, okay. I know that, like, the coast of Hilton Head is where they get some, uh, on the occasion, these, the real, real, like, terrifyingly big tiger sharks, but, uh. But the great white, that's an interesting one. Now, you know, when I think great whites, I think like, you know, uh, Southern California or yeah. South, South Africa or Australia. But, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing where they're starting to pop up lately. I mean, I know that they've been making the oh, news yeah, the lately. The water's getting warmer. The water's getting oh. warmer. And, uh, and while we were out there, because we were anchored out, David, and uh, all of a sudden, here's some uh, mahi-mahi there. And we caught four or five of them. I didn't think anything about them. They were only eight or 10 pounds. He said, those are the first ones he's ever seen in 27 years where we were fishing. 
And he did it all because of the water getting warmer. Mm. And uh, I don't want to get in that debate, but uh, things things are changing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like it or not, things are changing. Well, interestingly, those uh, those sleeper sharks, as I mentioned before, just on that topic, you know, that's like an Arctic species of fish, or at least they had thought so. Yes. Um, and apparently it's the longest lived, I don't know, animal in the world. Those things can live to be 600 years old. Yeah, I saw uh, that, 600 years old. Yeah, which is wild. And I guess one of those just recently popped up in the Gulf. Like, what is it? What are they doing down here? I don't know. They, down they, in they, Florida. They, they just, so. they just call it great wine in, in uh, Florida. Just, just shows we're always, I don't know, there's always more to learn. But, um, you know, scrolling through your page, I, it's like you bounce between these, you know, great oceanic creatures. You talk about the Napoleon wrasse. And um, it's funny, a lot of people don't even know what those are. I, I, I'm familiar with the Napoleon wrasse. That's a wild, a big, giant, blue barn door looking. I don't even know how to describe them. It's like a... I don't either. I don't it's like either. a big, blue, Goliath They're... grouper parrot fish thing. That's exactly uh, what that's what yeah. I would, that's what I would call them. I talked to yeah, a I, young guy. I in, I'm sorry, I was in uh, French Polynesia mm-hmm. three weeks ago, I believe, and we were <laughs> we really want to catch one. We, and the guy I was with, Steve Ryan, who is the absolute Steve. Goat. I know Steve. Yeah, Steve is he he's 155 pound. <laughs> I I never seen a guy that was so he makes me look like a shallow water man. He's really really good because he wants to catch one as well. Uh, we caught some amazing fish. It was a beautiful yeah. trip. So uh, they're a weird one. Like when I look at something like that, I would think that they're a deeper dwelling type of fish. But I I had a guy on here actually the the episode hadn't come up. It, ironically, he's the youngest person I've had on the show. 17 mm-hmm. um and he he's fished and he's actually traveled all over the world at a young age he's got a kind of an interesting story but he had caught him and he said that they caught him on poppers they were popping in in yeah, french polynesia for gts i'm like i would yeah. not have thought that but uh very interesting fish i can see why it's they on your bucket list New York, was it? uh gosh i don't know where he's originally from i think he might be anyway, from out west when, when i was there in french polynesia i met a guy from new york who had caught one on the same trip we were on. He wasn't with us, but he had caught one. But, yeah. It's a young uh, kid you named know, George they're, Hathaway. They're just, they're just kind of a, an iconic fish that guys like me, you know, this, this traveling deal we keep talking about, they're the core group, not it's the core group hmm. that actually the internet has really kind of got us together that we, I, I don't know how to explain. We're not trying to outdo each other, but it's, yeah, it's like it's like we're all traveling to new, different places, catching new and different species, and it's really interesting um, how the internet has really changed things up. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, you know what? I feel like that's one of like those great wild mysteries of the American angler. Is this type of fishing seems so commonplace for those guys over in the UK, and mm-hmm. you know the European guys are just. I don't know. They they just sort of have taken over that scene, and it's like, why are more like Americans not doing this? And Steve is like, obviously, you know, he's always somewhere in that mix. I've been following yeah. Steve for for years, chit chatting on often with him. But I don't know. I mean, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Like, why are more Americans not doing that? It, you're right. It seems like such a well, small. You know, um, um, you, you know, Dave. A lot of them are brainwashed over danger. You know, like Mexico mm-hmm. right now, they hear about four or five people getting kidnapped. And I've I've been in Mexico 200 times. I remember had Boo said, said to me, and I've been off the beaten path in Mexico, all over mm-hmm. Mexico. And you know what Mexicans say? They say it's more dangerous than the United States. Right, yeah. I live in Dallas, <laughs> Texas. Hell, we kill 20 people a weekend over here in Dallas. Good point. Just for the hell of it. <laughs> But yeah. you know, it's all it's all perception. I have that same perception when I go to some place that I hear bad rumors about. You know, you're you're looking over your shoulder a little bit. So, well, it it's, also it's, seems like maybe you know, and I've I've had the fortune of of meeting um, and fishing with a couple of of overseas guys, and it's I don't know, it's like a interesting mentality differences. It seems like a lot of American anglers are standoffish about meeting you know, meeting other anglers, you know, you, they, they don't mm. want to share information. They don't want to talk to another fisherman. 
And I know you've kind of alluded to the value in meeting new people and, and, and networking. Granted, you can't just be an open book with everybody, maybe, but uh, yeah. but uh, there's no more valuable, I don't know, tool in, in progressing your own fishing than than meeting other diehards and picking their brains. And Oh, just, I love it, golly. I'm yeah. just, like, just like Steve Ryan, I have a lot of people that I have met that I'm, you know, I'm so interested in where they've been and what they call and how they catch them. And, you know, it's just, it's just a big, uh, it's a, it's a merry-go-round to be honest with you, because you can never catch up. Every, everything's different. And like I said, we had, we had put money up to go to Russia, the, the political situation. We were going to go catch mm-hmm. the giant time and over there. Or yeah. Trinic. That got put off a long time ago. I was going to, uh, to Peru for the, uh, for the, uh, Saber tooth thief, what, what, what we call oh, the, the payara, the payara, yeah. And I have caught plenty of them, but the guy that I ran into that you can catch one over 40 pounds. In Peru. Oh, my I was gosh. Like, oh, man, going, yeah. That's one of the few trips that I turned down for political reasons that I had a choice because they were kidnapping Americans at that time. But mm. you know, honestly, most of that stuff is so overblown, it's crazy, but. Maybe I'm maybe I'm too naive as well. I mean, when I get that fish in my brain, I'm yeah. going. I'm <laughs> going. Fish. You know, forget about safety. And well, they life. say the same thing with the tiger fish. I I know that you mentioned that being on your bucket list, and that's kind of like you know, anytime you bring it up, that's the first the first uh, concern that gets thrown out is well, is that the, you named the one fish I have been to the Congo. Hmm. And I have fish for uh, Goliath tiger fish, but we had to cut our fish fishing trip close because they, in the area where I was fishing, Lake Tanganyika on the border, they kidnapped 13 uh, people the week I was down there, and they actually pulled us out of the area where we were fishing. Oh, so geez. it's not all it's not all milk and uh, oh yeah. Cake, well, you, know? you don't want to be naive, of course, right. but. Um... But yeah, so I'm I'm targeting my first trip overseas. But I mean, there's there's so many guys like myself in the position I'm in that are like still in that dream phase where it's like you're you're yeah. you want to. And I know we all feed off of guys like you, guys like Steve. Um, and you know you could just be enjoying that on your own and never sharing it. But uh, you've gone so far, and I mean, especially a guy like you who has the life experiences you have, you know, you'd be selfish to not write a book. But I do want to talk a little bit about the book. It's I guess this would be a spoiler alert for me because I'm <laughs> mine's mine's not in my mailbox yet. I was upset to yeah, see it wasn't in my I mailbox yet. Are. But tell me a little bit about that. At what point did you decide, you know what, I, I want to start putting some of this stuff down on paper. I, I want to dive down the book rabbit hole because that's a whole other beast, isn't it? It really is, especially for me. I, uh, I would never dream that Larry Walker would be writing a book about anything. <laughs> but I was thinking and I've had so many conversations and I keep notes. I'm, I'm a note keeper. And, um, I said, I was going to do it for my kids. This to show them all the things that I've done. And I've taken a lot of my kids with me. I've, mm-hmm. I've taken them to Africa and all over the place as well, but a lot of places they didn't go. And I was trying to document all the things I've done. It's not just fishing. It's what happens during the fishing. Uh, going there and the people you meet and the snakes and the crocodiles and the, you know I call it anaconda on a lure I've called crocodiles yeah. on the lure and, I, and it, it's just all the experiences and if you can see behind me yes I collect pre-Columbian art that I've collected in Honduras and in Mexico and Peru and I, a lot of it I've dug up myself it's all I didn't go there to get the pre-Columbia stuff. I went there fishing and that was this part of the day, part of the adventure. And I've got very interested in the, in that part of the deal too. And, and I, if I can show you my room, I've got 20 or 30 African masks. Yeah. I've got my headdresses. <laughs> I've got stuff that you don't buy at the souvenir shop. I'd be scared of some of that stuff. You don't hear drums at night, do you? <laughs> I've got you. I got a, I bought a drum the other day from an India. I like to get stuff from the natives. Yeah, you know, I've got arrowheads and teeth, and I'm a pack rat. I like all yeah. I got fishing, unusual fishing stuff, and uh, 
I don't know. I just, uh, I just, just savor my time on the, on the water and the time I get to travel so much. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a few of your posts where you sort of show, like, I wouldn't even call it a man cave. It's like a man kingdom, <laughs> like a whole wing of the house. I'm like, Oh my it's, God. It's, it's, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> you've run totally squirt. out of wall space with the with the mounted fish you've got i'm like well, well I, mean. I had the luxury of i had my marina and i had a restaurant that held 600 people and it was larry's museum i had 43 mounts that i had on the wall there mm -hmm. i sold it not this february last february to a big corporation and they let me keep my fish now they said they don't want them and now i've had to put them i've never had a <laughs> fish in my house now i've got fish in my house <laughs> I got my 1146 pound black marlin. It was 14 <laughs> foot nine inches. I had a wall, one wall that was 15 feet that I got to put it on, and some other smaller species I'm I'm putting in one room or so. I can't get rid of them. What am I going to do with them? They're part of my life. Actually, I mean, some of that I looks like you had to give a damn about it, but. Some of it looks like you had to cut a hole in the roof and lower it <laughs> in with a crane. Like, <laughs> but I tell you though, David, fishing has come at a cost as well. Not only financially, I used to, when I didn't didn't have the means to go fishing, I would rob Peter to pay Paul. If somebody said, "Let's go fishing in Mexico," I'm going. I'm going yeah. fishing. If I didn't have the money, I'm still going. In yeah. some way, I. <laughs> Now I'm, I have I do have the luxury of being able to travel about anywhere I want to, but but one of my points is I've been married five times, and there's not many women can put up with a traveling fisherman. You got to have a special mentality, mm -hmm. and you know when I get married, they all say, "Oh yeah, I'll go fishing," not for a month. They don't like it, right? Yeah, <laughs> they go for a long time. They say they do in the beginning, but it. I won't say fish, fishing ended the the marriages, but it, it had an impact on them. Mm -hmm. So I got yeah. a good one this time. I'm going to keep. Them. Yeah, I got, I got that. It's I guess um, you know, I had sort of uh, wrote down like you know what has kept you motivated this long, but it seems like you have absolutely not lost any step and motivation wise. Like I can I can hear it <laughs> bursting out of your ears. Um, the fact that it's that it's kept going, but I guess the other thing I had ask is, uh, you know, obviously you've been doing it for a long time. I don't know what you got to have some kind of keys for me here for like longevity. If you could give anybody advice for like longevity well, in this well, whole I'll thing, tell you, I'll tell you what's going on. My, my mother is ninety nine years old. She's still blonde headed. She drives a red Jaguar convertible. <laughs> She's got a memory like an elephant. <laughs> and 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 she never sits down. I can't sit down. I know when I was growing up, they call it you were just nervous, but I know I'm ADD, and uh, and and I can't sit still, and I'm busy all the time. I got to be doing something all the time, and yeah. I think that has a lot to do with it. It really does. Yeah, yeah. Now they want to put people on medication who want to who want to <laughs> like be have an act. It's just ridiculous. But um, yeah, so I guess. Um, you know, one question I get is like, you know, I look at your photo where, you know, you're holding maybe a golden Dorado in, and presumably that was Argentina. I know you've been to Argentina several times yeah. and then, uh, the black Marlin, it's like you're bouncing between ocean and, uh, fresh salt water, fresh water. Uh -huh. I don't know. Can you kind of compare the two? I mean, what do you get out of fresh water no, that you it, don't get out of salt water and vice versa? Well, you know, there's a lot of people only do fresh water. Yep. Some people only do salt water. I used to have a saying, I don't say it anymore. I like fresh water, salt water, and scotch and water. But yeah. I cut scotch and water. I don't <laughs> drink anymore. I've been yeah. <laughs> drinking a few years. Besides on my birthday, I drank them. Up. But I, I don't know. Is this the adventure, David, of getting out on the ocean? I've never been seasick in my whole life. I love the water so much. I mean, it. It's hardly, it's never too rough for me. And I, I push the limit on that as well. I don't, I just, I'm, I, I like both of them. And I like, you know, and I, I do not like one better than the other one. I will, mm -hmm. I am partial to black bass fishing because I grew mm -hmm. up in the business. We had a tackle store, like say, for 46 years. And, and we sold tackle. And I grew up in the bass fishing industry, really, actually. Yeah. 
but I like it all. I mean, I just, I love it all. You, uh, and I'm going to, I want to make, I want to make a statement that I'm going to get a lot of feedback on um, <laughs> is that I've never been interested in fly fishing. It does, it does not interest me. And I make this is a joke. And I have so many friends that are fly fishing. <laughs> crazy. I used to say the only thing I dislike more than fly fishing is fly fishermen. But that's a joke. <laughs> now, don't, 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 yeah. don't shoot me. But I, I don't enjoy fly I do fly fish when I have to. A lot of places I go to, when I went to Russia, you were only fly fishing only. Mm. And I've been, I do fly fish, but I don't enjoy it like I do uh, bait casting or spinning or, or other types of fishing. I just, I feel like I have more control. But that's just my opinion. We all have our opinions. And sure. I speak to my best friend that we agree on. Every, not everything. We never, and nobody ever agrees on everything. Your, your best, the different. best friends I have are the ones I talk the most shit to. So <laughs> this is how that works. Like, can't be too friendly. Then it starts to get weird. Got a yeah. rib on each other every now and then. But no, uh, I don't do a great deal of fly fishing myself. In fact, right now, I don't even own a fly setup at all. Doesn't yeah. mean I wouldn't like to maybe play around with it. But for me, it would only be, I don't know, it'd be playing. But I'm a, kind of the it, same it, way. It's, it's a deal. You know, I, I got one of my best friends. He holds like 21 world records. And uh, we went down in Columbia on a trip and he broke two rods and the lines wrapped around him and I'm yeah, catching yeah. fish like crazy. Golly, I caught so many <laughs> fish and he yeah. can't get the there were three people in the boat. That was a handicap for him. I mm -hmm. said, Why do you like this? He said, I don't know. I grew up fly fishing and I just like fly fish. But I I'm I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying it's not for me. I just I don't if if I had to fish for fly rod, I would, but it's not my preference. Let me put it to you that way. Kind yeah. of sugarcoated a little bit. I'll do it from time to time. I, uh, you know, when I was coming up and my, my granddad was a big fly fisherman and he pretty much like demanded it of us. Like when we came to visit him, he, he'd lay out the paper plates and the cups out in the yard and yeah. force us to practice our fly cast. So I get a little bit of a sentimental value out of it, I guess, if nothing else. But, uh, mm -hmm. but on the other thing, you mentioned not getting seasick. I can't say the same. I get horribly horribly seasick uh -oh. i don't know what it is i don't know uh -oh. if it's a genetic thing and it scares me because like i've got so many trips i want to do that i'm like Ugh. well i you know what if i well, can't i'm gonna i'm gonna tell I mean, you just... if you have that in your mind you'll never get it out no oh. I'm, I'm not gonna i don't want to put you on a bad deal but I know so many people they're seasick before they ever get in the boat mentally so it's gotta be anyway, a weakness either, you know uh, uh, by the way, Johnny Morris is on the Bass Pro Shop. He gets seasick too. By the way, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I met I met peace with it. I'm just like you know. I've gone out in the ocean a few times, and I just pretty much accepted like you know what I'm going to be chumming at yeah. the same time. But you know, you don't want to be that guy on the boat either. You know, now yeah. you're going to be the subject of all the jokes. So I'm like, damn. Well, that's that's true. There's something to that. I don't. I've got it in my mind. I'm just so focused on fish. I don't even think about mm -hmm. the motion on the bill. But I mean, like they were all different. They were all, yeah. all different likes. Well, maybe I can take some yoga classes and find <laughs> my inner, yeah, find my inner chi. But it's uh, it's and it's so bad. Like in like it's so much worse than what people tell you. So I'm like, good God, this is awful. So who knows? Doesn't mean I'll never go to the ocean again. But it's just that <laughs> hump I'm gonna hump I'm gonna have to get over. But uh. But uh, yeah, I love looking at your stuff. I love the sense of humor that you tie into everything too. It's not, it's not all like. I mean, I know it's strict. I know it's all business to catch the fish, but you find time to 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 make jokes. It was the uh, the rock climbing video you posted a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I got the biggest kick. Out <laughs> that was of that. great. <laughs> I fooled a lot of people. It fooled I... me with it at first. I'm like, there's no way this guy does it all. He's Superman. I'm like, he's out here rock climbing, and I'm like, oh. Damn, he got me. David, I like to have fun. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm not saying I'm a trickster, but oh, yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I, I like to be off the wall sometimes. I, some people are way too serious about all this stuff. I'm serious about fishing, but I like to have a good time. Yeah, that's great. But, um, yeah, your, your travel stuff, I can't get enough of it. And, you know, I know that you'd helped me in the past when I was doing a little – article i was writing with with the paddlefish uh i think you l lended me some photos i appreciate that but you know i'm kind of on the cusp of just starting 
my own like for me i think if i travel it'll probably be a once a year thing just just where i met my my financial state yeah will probably limit me but um i'm i'm booked for a trip to guyana in september which is one that i'm gonna love it you're gonna yeah. absolute love it it's that, uh, unbelievable that uh that's uh I, I mean, I I draw my interest back to that when I was a little bitty kid, like little kid. I I I I will go so far as to say I am shameless in saying I think if I catch like an arapaima, I might cry. No, uh, but well, they're, anyway, <laughs> they're, they're unbelievable fish. I mean, I've caught I've caught several of them on the trip I went. You know, mm -hmm. but we caught so many other fish. Golly, David, what are you going to a paradise? Yeah, you're going to a great place, and I—I I know I told you this before. They speak English. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. That, that thats nice. It's the bonus yeah. <laughs> when you, you go to the place in South America, and English is their number one language. Mm -hmm. and it, it seems like it's a small thing, but what it makes is you can actually talk to them. Right. You can talk to them and ask them questions. You know, I do not. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish. One of my regrets in life. I, I want to talk and have a con. I don't want to say. Yeah. You know, Coca Cola, hook, like you know, and talking in in words. I want to make sentences. And in uh, Guyana, you, you're gonna have you're gonna have a great trip. Yeah, yeah. And I'm looking I, I, forward. I, I'm sorry. No, I was I was just saying I'm I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I I don't I'm not necessarily well. My wife would agree with this. I'm not. I've never been the best like planner. I've never been, I've, I'm probably more your speed where I, a lot of times I just cannonball into opportunities, but still it's like, it does seem like an undertaking, especially, and that's just, you know, there's, there's much more probably difficult trips out there, but I am curious just to pick your brain on things. I mean, you're, you're so well traveled. Do you have a process for like, for planning these things? Cause to me, I'm like, Absolutely I don't know what I'm Absolutely not. I'm the yeah. most unorganized guy. <laughs> Ironically, now that you mentioned this, I'm going to. I'm going back to uh, La Zona for the Golden Dorado <laughs> with Jimmy Houston on April the 5th. And I have been absolutely sitting at our table, dining room table, putting hooks on lures. And I mean, I am so organized for this trip. It's crazy. Yeah. I hope they're biting what I'm taking, but it is uh, that's my number one freshwater fish too, by the way, the Golden Dorado. Okay. And it's a, it's an amazing fish. I mean, that's that ought to be on everybody's bucket. Uh, I guess the obligatory question, follow up question to that would be why, like you know, why, why those? I mean, I can see why, but I'm just curious. Like, well, why? here, here, here's the deal. Of course, I told you I fall in love with every fish I catch, but um, peacock bass were mine. I'm talking about freshwater. They're they're aggressive and they jump. Mm -hmm. You got monkeys and the parrots, and the, it's just yeah. the whole atmosphere <laughs> is just wonderful. But you don't have that for where we're going for the uh for the golden dorado but david you're throwing a lure out and when they hit it they'll jerk your arm out of your socket cool. and you gotta hold on we're using look 85 pound i mean 80 to 100 pound braided line with a 150 to 200 pound mono leader mm -hmm. I'm changing hooks on every lure I have till they'll straighten them out. They yeah. straighten out your your uh, your split ring. I had an interesting thing come up. I took a, one of my redneck friends down to Argentina for the Golden Dorado, and we're catching the hell out of them. I mean, they're biting. They jump and they're yeah. beautiful. They got teeth and they yeah. they <laughs> fight all the way up to the boat. And there's no giving up to them. And a friend of mine who caught a lot of big peacock bass and a lot of big black bass. He put the rod down. He said, Larry, <laughs> why do you want to catch these? They pull too hard. Yeah. I said, that's the reason I want to yeah. catch them. Pull, pull too, too hard. I mean, <laughs> it's nothing easy about them, to be honest with you. They're, 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 they're unbelievable fish. It's a wild-looking fish, too. <clears throat> that head, like, they're bu every time I see a photo of one, it almost looks like it's been edited. Like, it looks like they have such a weird shape where it's like, I don't know, all their features are the head on them. I just can't get, oh, I just saw a cameo. I just saw, I just saw a wet nose into yeah, the screen. Right. I have a Bernie <laughs> Mountain Dog, and he won't. Oh, I love me those. Alone, okay. And I won't leave him alone either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all, we got to love our animals. We got to love oh, our dogs. I love, I'm, I'm, and I, I, that's another thing. I find a dog 
every trip I go to, I oh, go, yeah. <laughs> I'm in Polynesia. There's I got three dogs at my doorstep every morning. <laughs> when I was in uh, Mexico, when I was in, uh, I did not have one in uh, Guyana. That's the one place I did. But I mean, I'm envious of you going. That's a, that's a great. I'd like to do that trip again. It was great. Yeah, that's funny. The dogs always know who to go to. There's like a <laughs> spiritual bond dogs. that takes place. I'm the same way. I got I got my two beloved German shepherds. Yeah. Uh, they can be a pain in the ass, but they but, are they man. are definitely a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, mine's but uh, I wouldn't take for them. Mine's uh mine's well that my my older dog's the first dog I ever had. Back when I was still doing police work, it was like my my little German shepherd and he's been there for the birth of both of my kids and through all the moves. So now he's nine, so it's like getting to that age where I don't know, you get like super sentimental about him, but I don't want to hijack the f- conversation about fish and turn it into the dog podcast. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, those Dorado, um, I don't know. My list of things I want to catch is so long, but you know, you got to take it step by step. Um, is there anything you've caught that is probably not on somebody's like, like wave or, uh, I don't know, radar that should be like one that's like, wow, I'd have never thought about this as a fish to, to send people uh, after. You know, you know, you had quizzed me about the spoonbill. And they're mm-hmm. such an interesting fish. Oh, for sure. And you, you know they don't bite. You right. Don't catch them. you snag them, and there again was the live scope. Yep. And um, and they they jump, but they're so freaky looking when you bring them out. They got little bitty eyes. Yeah. They got this gigantic weird uh, gill plate cover, and they're plankton eaters, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they got this big long spoonbill looking thing on them and uh, they're soft they got they don't have any scales they're 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 actually kin to sturgeon yeah and uh, and uh, i caught a golly i caught a 116 pounder up in oklahoma up at uh, what, uh keystone lake okay I caught, I caught quite a few of them i've been up there twice um i, I don't think i would do it on a day-to-day basis but they're so unusual and um, and they jump. And I like fish that jump. Mm-hmm. Fish, if, you, if fish jump, they go up on my up on my. Deal. I like jumping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a soft spot in my heart for like the prehistoric fish, like the ones that survived. I don't know, just from like you know, because they kind of fall obviously fall into that category mm-hmm. of prehistoric fish. But I've always looked at with a little bit more admiration to the fish that are like tried and tested and like battle hardened. Like any fish that's been around that long, it's like, okay, that's like, that's what I want on the end of my line. So that's always what drew me to like alligator gar and to the sturgeon. I'm going to go one in Florida. You got mudfish. They're very, uh, they're, they, you uh, know what? That is my favorite species. And I get people, I get the weirdest looks from people. Like, people don't like them. That is my all time. They they pull, they, I love them. They they they're actually they look like they're akin to the golden dorado even they're not as mm-hmm. pretty as the golden dorado but they got that armor uh, gill yep. plate deal and I've caught quite a few of those in Florida yep. we have I hadn't caught any lately in Texas but uh, I used to catch them in, in Texas I didn't, caught, I didn't target them I caught yeah. them I caught them in like seven that. different states and I don't know what it is about that fish I mean it was like that was like the one I kind of started fishing with when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So I get real sentimental about it, but, yeah. but I love bowfin and it's like, people are like what? And I don't care where I fish from here until the day I die. That'll always be like the one that I don't know. I hold like near and dear to the heart, but, um, you know, and I actually had caught, uh, a sturgeon in Florida, which not you a did? lot of people, oh, yeah, yeah. not a lot of people can say that. I'm like, I've seen that's, photos of those. That's yeah. one I could beat my chest about. I'm like, ah, I know nobody's done this. Yeah. But um, but that was I dumb. have never caught one. That was all like, dumb luck. I've caught the, the <laughs> ones in, in the in the rivers. Right? I was disappointed that it didn't. They didn't jump. I'm like, why? You know, they jump. Hell, those the Gulf sturgeon mm-hmm. jump for no reason. They're like in the rivers. That's mm-hmm. what they're famous for. They're breaching and jumping, and then you hook them. They don't jump at all. But. But um, yeah, I've always loved the prehistoric fish. The spoonbill is one that I've seen people catch them right next to me. When I lived in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. we'd see them, you know, I'd be gar fishing below dams for, you know, long nose mm-hmm. gar or something. There's always the snaggers are always up at the dams at like Grand Lake and, yeah. and Oolaga and some of those places. But it's a fascinating one. Maybe I'll find time to do that one. But um, I don't know, the snagging thing 
I think I could get past that. It's a little different. It's strange. No, I'll be honest with you. When you say snag, that kind of turns me on, off. I wasn't interested in it, but uh, I did it. Like I said, I wouldn't want to do it every day. We mm. didn't harm the fish. Yeah, sure. You know, we're, we're using a barbless deal. Mm -hmm. I think people eat them. I'm not for sure. I don't eat fish. I, I'm not a fish. Anymore. I actually, I don't either. I, I, I will. I, I'm not, I'm a hypocrite because every once I'll eat a mahi mahi every once in a while. And I do like sushi or sashimi tuna. Um, <laughs> I rarely eat fish. I was, a, I had a commercial fishing business forever and that really turned me off. on fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could see that. I worked in the food manufacturing industry for a while and you know, you get, mm -hmm. You get a lot of that. I worked in poultry processing for a little while, and people are like, "Yeah, are you ever going to eat chicken again?" I'm like, "Hell yeah, I love chicken. <laughs> like, I don't care what I've seen, but uh, but yeah, that's <laughs> it's funny. I do <laughs> like lobster. I was I had a lobster fishing. I had three boats that I had in Honduras. Uh, we were uh, catching the spiny lobster down there, and I love lobster. You can't get enough. You know, you go to a restaurant, you get a a lobster about this big, yeah. two bites and it's over, yeah. you know, $25. <laughs> so I, I got on the boat and I'm eating lobster every day. Guess what, David? I got sick of lobster. I didn't yeah. want to eat lobster. <laughs> right. But now I, I like lobster again, so I'll be eating lobster again. Yeah, I, I get a lot of funny looks from the people who don't fish, obviously, the people who don't, don't fish, and then they see my stuff and they're like, do you eat them? I'm like, nope. I spend all that money. Buy all that gear, do all that travel to, to to catch a fish and hold it in front of a camera and then let it go. And that's, that's my just, number one question. That's on just what Facebook, I do. You, uh -huh. you know, I'm a big Facebook. I love Facebook. Uh -huh. But everybody, did you eat them? Yeah. You didn't. <laughs> you didn't turn them loose. And my what'd you do with it? Yeah. Yeah, my grand. They said, "What'd you?" My grandmother used to say every time, "Oh my goodness, you turned them loose." Yeah. Why did you turn them loose, Larry? Yeah. She never could ever understand. She was fishing till she was a hundred years old. She would go crappie fishing at the marina. We'd put a life jacket on her and, and give her a zip code, and she'd go out there crappie fishing on the dock. So yeah, I had my, fishing in my blood. Uh, my my granddad would curse me out when he saw me letting fish go. I was like, yeah, he's <laughs> a kind of the same way. He was not happy if I was letting fish go. Yeah. But I don't really, you know, I don't know, especially freshwater fish. I just don't really eat freshwater fish. I yeah. Occasionally do the saltwater thing, but. Yeah. Like I say, I'm I'm kind of hypocritical because I do sometimes. But um, the other day we caught some mahi mahi down in Polynesia, and uh, I brought it back to the restaurant for them to cook for everybody. And I couldn't eat it. I just could not eat it. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I've eaten iguana, rattlesnake, armadillo, <laughs> everything you can ever dream of. I don't eat manna. I don't eat salad dressing. I'm yeah. a weird eater. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm probably the same way. I'm like, uh, you know, real into like fitness and stuff, but like, I just can't eat well. I eat the nastiest food. I eat junk mm -hmm. food. I don't know. My eating habits are going to catch up to me one of these days. I've just been lucky so far. Well, I quit. I, I'll be honest with you. I quit yesterday. No more junk food. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yesterday was it. I, I, I've had all day to die. I told my wife, yeah. <laughs> no more chocolate ice cream and no more M&Ms. <laughs> but I don't know how long it'll last. We'll see. All right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you're always on the move and you're always catching all, I mean, you've done all these crazy trips and I know you got the bucket list, but what's on the agenda, I don't know, for the rest of this year? Well, I'm like I'm going to Idaho next week for the uh for the smallmouth bass god i want to I, I want to get into the elite deal of catching one that weighs mm. nine pounds Oof. that would be that would be good the guy i'm going with it caught one and then i'm going to uh, the argentina deal with uh with jimmy then i'm going back to jurassic for the uh the 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 rainbow trout i'm going back mm. to argentina i like argentina yeah Going back for the king salmon next year, we're going to go a little earlier and see if we can catch some bigger ones. Then I just signed up to go uh, bluefin tuna fishing in Nova Scotia. Ooh. I've done that quite a bit. I usually fish on the Prince Edward Island side, and that's an amazing animal, too. They're just so humongous. Oh my gosh, yeah. And then I'm going to go back to Africa to do blue marlin and Cape Verde. 
And uh, I'm going back to Florida, your state, in February when the fish were spawning there for the bass. Yeah. Then in May, we're going out to Lake Havasu for the giant red air purse or brim. Mm. You know, they're gigantic. Out oh, there. yeah. And uh, uh, I didn't catch it. She, I caught one that weighed three pounds, 88, which I thought was huge. <laughs> right, yeah. But my friend caught a 434. And the guide I'm going with this year called a uh, 595 and a 525 last year. Jeez. You know, you always put bass, crappie, perch. Now it's bass, perch, crappie. So that's that's the new that's the new deal. Yeah, those but get surprisingly big. Anywhere. Someone calls me up and I'm and I'm available. I'm gone. Count, count me gone. Have you done the Nile perch one? That's one that's kind of an yes, interesting I have. one to me. I didn't do very well on those. I, I spent a month in the, it was amazing. Uh, I had a honeymoon and we were going to spend it together in Africa. And she decided she didn't want to go. So I went anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> on my honeymoon, I spent a month in Africa and I went Nile perch fishing. And I caught some up to about 15 pounds, which was very very small but i went on the zambezi river and we caught tiger fish and that's in the nether oh yeah 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 yeah. uh yeah i had to ask about the nile perch one that was one that i kind of toyed with as maybe being the first trip that i do out but i didn't you know it's i thought i thought the risk of i don't want to say failure was greater and it's just one fish and it's one species but uh but i looked at that i'll tell you that that's a hard one yeah. That's a hard one because they have commercial fish so hard in Africa that they're they're the great big ones are almost non non existent. Yep. There is a guy that fishes uh at Murchison Falls and he caught mm-hmm. a few big ones. It's very, very unpredictable. Yeah, that's really. what I saw. It seems like Murchison Falls you'll still see some numbers, but like closer to the falls, it looks like smaller ones. And I don't know, I've seen a few down river that looked okay, but that that one seems to If you go to Africa, please do the tiger fish. Tiger fish, yeah. I mean, this is the this is a two in one trip because if you went on the on the Zambezi River, which I really recommend, is that you're on the sightseeing trip the whole time. You're floating down the Zambezi River. I'm throwing a lure at the feet of herds of elephants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's hippos over here. Here's here's water buffalo over here. Zebra on the shoreline. I mean, it's like a National Geographic trip. It's oh. so beautiful. Those hippos really, intimidate me. I've seen a lot of videos of them getting a little rowdy with the boats. Well, they are. They they are. The <laughs> natives are just uh, terrified of them. And I guess I'm so naive about it. I wasn't so. Uh, uh, I was on Lake Tanganyika, and when the natives came in from fishing, you wouldn't believe. It. You think they were in the uh, the Olympics when they get close to the shore. The the uh, hippos were hanging out there. And it looked like, I mean, really and truly, they, they, they're they petrified of them. They're petrified. Mm. I guess probably I could, for a good reason. Yeah. yeah, I could see that. I know they're, well, I guess they, apparently they kill more people each year than any other animal in Africa, unless you count, you know, bugs, mosquitoes or something. But Well, mosquitoes, of course, is the number one killer. Yeah, but, but, you know. But the hippos are bad. They're, they're big. They're really big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you see them at the zoo. I, th- I tell every, all of my friends about traveling. If you're going to go anywhere, it, of course, fishing is always paramount. People need to go to Africa. What mm-hmm. a beautiful place. It's nothing. When you're seeing animals in the wild with no fences, or it's just amazing. It really is. It makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah. That's that's one I'd like to do. Africa, obviously. I, I'm really interested in the I think it's KwaZulu Natal, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's like the southern, uh, southeastern coastline. Very famous for some of the land based uh, shark fishing and surf casting scene down there. They catch some wild stuff down there. They call it like the KZ yeah. KZN coastline. Yeah, they they get they catch a lot of bull sharks there. They catch those. Uh, they call them sandies. The big uh, guitar fish, those big giant, giant oh, yeah. guitar fish. Yeah. That's yeah. an interesting one to me, but I don't know. So so much time or so many fish, so little time. Who knows? Mm-hmm. That's that one's that's an interesting I one. I want to catch the fish as well because y'all have them in Florida, but they're illegal to catch uh, the target the saltfish. Yeah. I, 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 I hooked two of them in 
Australia years ago when I foul hooked them. They were up on the sandbar, and I had a jack with them, so I threw a lure over them. Cause they were, they were like twelve foot long. That I don't know. They seemed like they were hundred foot long when I saw. Them. Yeah, that's they, one of those things that every time I go shark fishing, you know, it's a little part in the back of your mind, sort of hoping you'll get to see them, but it's it's like that unicorn type of thing. Yeah, they're a unicorn. But, uh, well, we have alligator guard in Florida too, and it's the same way. They're in only like select few small rivers, but I'm like, I really want to catch a Florida alligator guard, but apparently it's illegal to even pursue them so i'm like who knows really yeah it's kind of weird they're totally weird. protected like all those exotic species there so. yeah no kidding but uh yeah the exotic thing down here i don't know that kind of plays out a little quick to me the the peacocks here anyway i mean they're kind of fun they just they get a little old I, when i first moved to florida i was all about it but i got a little burnout on that one pretty quick but um anyway well, you know something? I, I have no interest in those in florida that's it's like a novel. You know, they, don't, they, they just don't get big. And, nope. You know, a 12 pounder is the big one. And my, I just got a, I don't know if you can see it. I just got a, uh, uh, one of I my reps back. I saw and the just, photo. Will that thing even fit in the frame? Yeah, I just, I just got it. Oh and, man. Uh, that's awesome. 23 pounder. I caught. <laughs> and the guy, the guy, the guy did the mount in, uh, Columbia. Mm -hmm. He's an absolute, He's not. He's not a taxidermist. I'd call him an artist. Artist, yeah. He's an artist. The replica and, uh, guys he, are phenomenal. Yeah, he he did a uh, a arapama for me that I caught in Guyana where you're going. Oh wow! And he did it from scratch, no mold. He did huh. it from scratch, and it came out perfect. And uh, I loaned it to a tackle shop over in Dallas, but it probably the fish probably weighed two hundred and fifty pounds. Mm -hmm. that you're gonna hey, you're gonna catch some big fish when you go to Guyana. Be ready. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I mean that's that's the one I've been waiting on. So I'm like, I ah, might as well go with the top, the top trip first if yeah. I'm gonna go anywhere. But um, but anyway, um, I know I feel like I've kept you. I could probably talk to you for hours more. Well, we we can always talk after the fact. You know what I mean? But yeah. but um, but we've talked about your book, and I and I want to bring that up a little bit more. And I know that you've just kind of started getting into the YouTube thing, but like you've you've done so much amazing things from minnows to marlin. Um, so I guess I want to make sure I'm directing people who are listening to this, like where they can go to see your stuff, where yeah. they can go to pick up the book, what your YouTube channel might be, anywhere that they can find your your stuff like how could people find the book yeah. what's the youtube channel how could they find anything else yeah. well the the book is is uh, available on Am i haven't pushed it i've kind of mentioned it a little bit on facebook but i haven't said to go buy it i've actually just hired a marketing team to do a launch because i'm hoping you can sell some books for me too and then on the on the YouTube deal, my son, I have a 37-year-old son that's another fishing nut, too. He's yeah. completely <laughs> overboard with it, too. He's got a new baby that's kind of slowed him down. But he's helping me, as I told you before we started doing the show, I'm technically handicapped. Yeah. I can do email and Facebook, and that's about it. But we're doing this YouTube deal, and it's a learning experience for it. But, you know, honestly... I hope people subscribe to it and see it. But honestly, I'm trying to, I like for people to see what I get to do. Mm -hmm. David, it's amazing. I mean, eight pound smallmouth bass, 23 pound rainbow trout, king salmon, dorado, black bass. I mean, I'm so blessed. It's crazy. I'm really, really blessed. And I still have, I can still jump in and out of a boat at 77. I feel good. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It might change tomorrow. I see a lot of my friends, my age, they're not doing so good. And I feel very blessed. I uh, I hope it keeps on going. Of course, that my last sentence in my book is, I want to catch a marlin when I'm 100 years old. And I back it up by saying, I hope there's still a marlin when I get 100 years old because the world changes. Well, the world it's funny because like I feel like every stressful encounter I have with a fish, I always kind of wonder: Am I adding years to my life, or am I taking yeah. years off? But uh, maybe you're a testament to the fact that getting out and and doing some adventure and and doing these kind of hard trips uh, is the key to 
I don't know. You got to have a fulfilling life. And so it's probably adding fuel to the tank. Um, so for sure, I think I, I agree. More people need to see this stuff. I'm blown away by the stuff I see on your page. It's, it's insane. Yeah, well, and then just, so and the fact that you're not stopping, like it's like, it just, it's the consistency. I oh, yeah. David, I can't stop. I couldn't stop if I wanted to. It's, it's, kill me to stop. it's, it's nuts. But like my wife, my, my wife, Shelly is so, she's so, uh, she didn't say no. She did tell me that, to be honest with you, about a month ago, she said that I would like to see you a little bit more often. That was the first hint she said about yeah. me wearing my welcome out. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Well, I, 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 um, I don't know. I see a lot of guys. I mean, P Fisher commit. I mean, anglers can do whatever they want, but I do kind of sometimes watch other guys that I know who fish settle. I don't want to say they settle, but it's like, you know, that's, they don't even recognize the, the, like what lies on the other side, like, or the whole, the full potential that the fishing world has that transcends beyond a five pound bass, a yeah. 10 pound, I don't know, whatever. Um, but you, you have showcased, <laughs> I don't know that, that very wide spectrum of, uh, of what anglers can do if they just have a little mm -hmm. bit of ambition and an adventurous spirit. And I love the fact that you don't make it sound like it's something nobody can do. You're like, hell, yeah. even when I didn't have money and I wanted to go, I made it happen. And I, I think made that's it a happen. I really did. I, yep. I, I, I surprised myself. I, 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 I go, I go, I can't say no. Yeah. If you call me right now, Tomorrow, I didn't have anything to go, do. I'd be down in Florida. <laughs> if you, if you yeah. had something going on, I'd be down. I can't say no. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot say no. I don't want to say no. I don't even like no. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can offer anything. I don't know if I personally can offer you anything that, that, that meets your standards. Uh, I do a little bit uh, of the land, the land based Goliath thing. You might enjoy that. Now, catching a Goliath grouper from shore, that's, that's fun. Oh, that and, would be, that would and, be cool. And, and be I, really I, cool. I do understand that game uh, uh -huh. pretty good. But, uh, you know, who knows? If you're ever crossing through my neighborhood and uh, and you mentioned not being tech savvy, that's probably a good thing. You, <laughs> you can get poisoned by this whole, I try to not do it. I dabble in it a little bit, but you, you, you just, I don't know, the, the computer and the social media and the, even the YouTube thing, it's like, Ah, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like you need it for marketing. You yeah. need it for information sharing, but you can get so sucked into it that, I don't know, it's like it takes away the time from fishing. It's like counterproductive. Well, it does. You're right so. about that exactly. You know, with, and I, in my travels, there's nowhere I go that they don't have a cell phone. I'm in Africa. The little kids are running around Africa with a cell phone. Oh, that's I'm weird. America, kids have got them. I'm talking about everywhere I go, People got cell phones. It's it's changed the world. It made it smaller, maybe too small sometimes. But anyway, nothing. Yeah, <laughs> double edged sword. There, it's like you need it to be able to to learn, but you, you get sucked into it and you get stuck dreaming. Like I don't want to watch other people do my dream trips. Yeah, I want I want to go do them, but I do like Absolutely. and I really appreciate yeah. guys like you, especially willing to share the stories through book through podcast conversation, through your YouTube channel, through your Facebook. Um, man, I, I could talk to you for hours, uh, yeah. but I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to hold you up. Um, but anyway, Larry, I appreciate your time. Yeah. Uh, thank you, David. You're, you're, you're probably one of the most motivating guys that I, that I watch. <laughs> I enjoy seeing his tell Jimmy Houston. I'm a fan. Tell him little old David Graham said, hello. Yeah, uh, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I just called him while ago. He, yeah. where he's pumped up on this uh, Argentina trip. He gets pumped up pretty easy too. Well, he 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 ain't slowing down either. That's awesome. That's the no, that's, he's, not. he's that's, older than me. He's seventy nine, I thought. Uh, well, I I can well, only he's hope in good shape. he gets around good. I, I can only hope and pray that I'll be doing the same when 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 I get to that uh, level. But Larry, I'm good. I, I, I appreciate your time. I look forward to seeing the next adventures and the photos that you post. Big, big fan. And, uh, man, I couldn't be more appreciative of you taking time to talk to well, me. Thank you, David. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yep. Yes, sir. For sure. All right, Larry. We'll we'll be in touch. Let's go fish. It. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. We can plan something. All right. Yep. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the Boundless Pursuit Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, your feedback, comments, and reviews are very important to me. Also, this podcast is just one element to a much bigger content outlet. I urge you to head over to www.haverodswilltravel.com where you'll find audio, visual, and written editorial content. That is three dimensions of awesome fishing content brought to you by a very dynamic team of anglers. I hope that you'll tune in next week as we continue to build this program and have interesting and skilled anglers each Thursday. Thank you for listening.